Okay. So um, I'm Elizabeth Garin and I have, I'm married to Luke Garin and I have Casimir and Nyla are my children at church. If you've seen those little ones around. So I am, uh, when I'm not doing art and things at church, <laughs> I am at a Montessori school in Lancaster. I'm a toddler teacher. So I have ages 17 months to three years old. So that's what I teach. And behind me is my classroom. So it's, there you go. I'll kind of get out so you can see it. Um, I want to open up before I really start talking. And I'd like to just read something from, it's called The Secret of Childhood, written by Maria Montessori, who um, discovered the Montessori method um, in the early 1900s, late 1800s to 1900s. <clears throat> She's talking about a child's love for an adult. But who teaches them all this? Who can teach one how to love? Will it be the adult who calls all of his childish manifestations tantrums and who only thinks of defending himself and his possessions from the child? In the evening, he goes to bed. A child calls the person he loves and does not like to see him go. And when we go to dinner, the child who is still being nursed would like to come along, not to eat, but simply to be near so that he can watch us. It is a terrible nuisance when a child goes in to wake up his father and mother in the morning. But what drives a child to go in search of his parents as soon as he gets up? If it is not love, when a child bounces from his bed early at the break of day, he goes to find his still sleeping parents as if to say, learn to live holy. It is already light, it is morning. But a child goes to his parents not to teach them, but only to see again those whom he loves. And she then goes on to talk about <clears throat> she actually uses a lot of spiritual uh, scripture passages and talks a lot about um, Jesus. So this is kind of the end of the chapter here. And she says, the dramatic pages of the gospel bear witness to the fact that adults should console Christ hidden in the poor, in the condemned and in the suffering. And if we apply this stirring scene to children, we can see that Christ appears to men also under the guise of a child. I loved you. I came to wake you in the morning and you rejected me. But when Lord, did you come to my house in the morning to wake me and I rejected you? When your child came to call you, it was I. When he begged you not to leave him, it was I. Fools, it was Christ who came to waken us and to teach us love. But we thought that it was only a childish whim and thus lost our hearts. So that passage really inspired this issues class because I realized in my journey here with Montessori that it's the child who has taught me so much about God himself and the life that God kind of created here. Um, before I begin, I know there's not quite a, too many people, but does anybody have an idea? Like when I, do you know what the Montessori method is at all? Or have you heard of it before? Heard of it, don't know what it is. Luke can't answer. Cause he's like, my wife talks about it 24 <laughs> seven. <laughs> so I like to put it simply, it's following the child. Uh, the Montessori method is, first off, she never really wanted it to be called the Montessori method. Um, and it was, I'll give you just a quick little background on how it was discovered, just to give you some con context before I really start to talk about uh, the classroom, the environment, and what I do. 
So Maria Montessori, um, and I'm no historian. <laughs> so for those of you who probably know like more of the history, this is like a very basic overview. But she was the, um, she lived in Italy. She was a physician, which for that time as a woman, you could not, uh, she was the first woman physician in Italy. And she did not go to school to be a teacher. She actually had never really done education. She founded this Montessori method through kind of her side enjoyment of doing experiments. And she was, and at the time, with psychology, she would go in and there was a big um, building that had a lot of children who were not old enough to go to the public school system. So they were really young children and they were running around the town when all of their parents were off in the factories working. So they came up with a, in the bottom floor of this huge apartment building, a room with one teacher for all these children, just to sort of keep them <laughs> in contain. And she saw this as a great opportunity to go and observe. And she was observing children in this environment. And she found that they, when they were able to take care of themselves, um, which means like kind of actually taking care of their physical health, but then able to kind of take care of their environment, like cleaning the classroom, that they started to thrive and they really wanted to kind of work with things. And she just sat back and really watched what natural human child development um, was. And so it's really, I, it's really kind of comes from the child. And so to me, when I was reading about this, I felt like, I mean, God created us all. And so this to me is a really spiritual um, way to teach children because it comes from what God created. Um, and then uh, she went on, there was this kind of school and things started to happen. And I know you can see in the background, there's lots of shelves in my room. And they, that kind of did, was not the original concept of a classroom, but the, it was, they were in cabinets, like all of the kinds of things that are out on these shelves would have been in closed cabinets and they were locked by the teacher at the end of day. But one, one morning, the teacher didn't come to unlock the classroom. And so the students actually found a way into the window, unlocked the classroom and all the students came in. And that night, the teacher did not remember to lock the cabinets. And all of these young children, got into the cabinets, took their work out, went and sat down. You can see tables and chairs is a very common thing. They go to sit down and work. And so when the teacher showed up, all of the students were working. And this really showed um, Maria, like, well, they, why, what if they actually had access to this work? Like, what if they were able to go to get it themselves and it wasn't an adult who needed to sort of open these cabinets and get it out? So that was where the open shelving concept came in. And if you see sort of the Montessori is a little bit popular, right, you know, in some ways. And so if you kind of look at the commercial aspect of it, you'll see a lot of pretty toys on open shelves. Um, and that's where that idea really came from. Um, okay, so that's a little bit of a background on sort of how this began. And then it really started to grow um, as she opened up more schools and then started to train teachers. And there's the works that we use in our classroom are still originally what she had designed back in the beginning of the 20th century. So it's been a, a time, even though there's been so much change in our world in that time, the Montessori method has really stayed true because it follows the child and their natural development. And over time, culture, um, the child is really still the same <laughs> when they're born. Um, yeah. Okay. So the next thing I kind of wanted to talk about um, was kind of to show you a little bit about what our classroom is and what the works are. Um, we call them works on shelf. So a child 
takes a work off the shelf and will actually do it. So I'm going to sort of set myself up like I am. I'm sitting at a small table right now in my classroom. And this is what you would normally see in our day is children come in and there's no like assigned desks for them at all. They just um, come in and they're able to freely work. They can work on the floor. They can work at the tables. We have more tables in the back. So I wanna kind of bring what would look like a work over to give you some context when I say that too. Um, so let me... So this is a typical Montessori material. This is a dressing frame. Um, and the work is simply, it's a zipper. So it teaches them practical skills like zippering our coat. We have snapping, buttoning, Velcro, um, buckles. Uh, buckles is when you kind of get, it, get into primary. But they would take this work and they would sit it on a, they would sit it on a table and they would try to work on it. And I would maybe show them just by opening it up and then inviting them after I show them to do it. And a child will work on this for, for weeks, for months until they actually can, can do it. And that's the nice thing about it always being out. But bef um, And then I'll show you an, a different kind of work So a lot of works uh, would be on trays. So the children can carry all parts of the work to the table. This is a more advanced work. Um, and so this is non, this is one of the fun ones. A lot of children love this, but this is a kind of a hammering work. And so this is non-hardening clay in here. And so the, the great part about this work is that you kind of, have this fine motor skill of needing to open this jar to get out the actual teas. We have really young children in the classroom. So I do this also so that young children cannot just take these off the shelves. But if you're older, if you're an older child, then it sort of gives you this other part to the work. And they would just like put these in and hammer them down. So it's, it's interesting because a lot of works are, it's called, it's called practical life. It's things that you actually have to do in life, like opening containers and, you know, as you get older, ha like hammering that action and then, um, pouring a lot of, we have a lot of pouring works as well and things like that. And then they would take this back to the shelf exactly where they got it from. A lot of parts of the um, environment, it's... I was gonna share this thing, but it's the it's environment and it's child and it's the adult. And those three things working together are kind of what create the Montessori uh, classroom. So the adult is me or my assistants or any adult who comes in the room. And then there's obviously the child. And then the environment is the classroom, the outside. I mean, every part that they're interacting with is the environment. Um, okay, so this is, uh, sorry, I feel like I'm just rambling because I usually talk in, in, with other people. Um, it's kind of, yeah. Okay. I know that I really wanted to share, I just kind of wanted to give you a few like concrete things to think about as you, uh, when I say these works when I say things like the environment uh, to understand a little bit about what I'm talking about. But one of the things that made me want to do this talk was the fact that as I started to get into Montessori, when my son was born, I mean, I have been in, I went to school to be an art educator. I liked alternative settings, but 
after having my son and realizing, okay, when, what kind of parent did I want to be? Um, I kind of went back to my roots and I really explored Montessori because I felt like the great thing about the Montessori method is it one, it comes from the child. It's very child centered. Um, and I, I felt like it worked for any child that I, no matter who my child was, I was following the child. So, <clears throat> um, I started kind of doing Montessori at home and then I ended up getting a really small part-time job at a Montessori school. And when I went into a school, it was like, my mind was blown about what I saw children working, cleaning up their environment, like picking up after themselves, helping one another. It was quiet. It was calm. I'm not always quiet. We had fun and, but it was just sort of this very peaceful environment. And it felt so different than anything I had really experienced in my own, um, education journey. And I felt like something, I felt like the child, like all of the children there were very happy and they were able to take care of themselves. And because of that, it was, they were able to really show the adults what they were capable of. Um, so I, and I, I enjoyed being in the classroom and that's what then really made me get a little bit more serious about wanting to pursue that in my career and do that. And it just so happened that in my journey, God placed that I could actually be at a school full time. My children come here. So Casimir is in the primary class and Nyla's in the other toddler class here. So I still get to be with my children, which is really nice. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, so as I was exploring Montessori, I started to realize that as I was doing this with my children, it was changing who I was as a person in a, gr a really great way. It was, I felt like helping me kind of be who God created me to be. I was much more present and in the moment because when I come into a classroom here and I'm here every day, there is no time to think about myself. <laughs> There's no time to think about what happened that morning or what I didn't do at home or, you know, what's going to happen this weekend. I am a hundred percent in the moment and present and with, with the children. And that's what this kind of environment um, provides. And I think that's what God kind of intends for us to do is to be present because if you're present, you're actually able to be there for others. You're able to be there. You're able to hear him and what he's trying to tell you in your life. So I found then all of a sudden I was so much happier at home and I felt like I was so much closer to God and that every day since starting this journey, I have just felt like God is closer and closer to me. Um, so that really influences a lot of what I do, um, you know, at church volunteering. And it's why I love to volunteer, you know, and help, help Emmy with the children's ministry, because it's just, they show me too, what it is to be a child of God and what I can learn, what I learn from them is amazing. And what they have to kind of say um, when you really get the chance to sit and listen to them and talk with them. Uh, I found that to be really life-giving. Um, okay, so trying to like, again, I'm so used to more of a back and forth. So <laughs> I'm kind of going through this. Um, so that's kind of how my faith life was um, influenced. And then I felt I felt as if like when I was able to slow down and be present, I was so much closer to, I was, I was praying more. I had this trust in God that he would provide. Like I, and I felt like even though there was storms surging around me, I was able to be kind of like calm and know that he was going to get me through. And that's been, um, so it's been nice to find a place of work that really helps my own faith life and doesn't really kind of um, compete with that. 
So kind of going into talking about what we do at church is actually Debbie um, had done a, mon there's a Montessori curriculum called Godly Play, which was done in Kiwi. Um, and it's all of those little, they're these kind of wooden figures, maybe buildings, temples, parts to a story. And you act out the story with these parts. And I remember visiting Derry when, um, cause I joined back in 2017. So when I was pregnant with Casimir, you know, I remember joining, kind of looking around and seeing these things and Debbie and I hit it off and we're talking and, um, I started to incorporate that kind of godly play into where I was working at the time as a children's ministry director. And then I started to think about the Sunday school classroom because I was a children's ministry director at a Lutheran church for a couple of years. And I started to think about the environment, just like in Montessori, you think about the environment, where things are in relation to yourself and um, how they're accessible to you. And I started to go, well, what if I kind of really thought about the classroom where a child could explore their faith in the way that the spirit is leading them. So it would be, we would do a story, but then there would be maybe a soft reading corner that would have books relating to what we were talking about. And then maybe there was a kind of a little table that had, um, you know, a picture that you could draw that would relate to the story. And then there was a little table with uh, bins and you would maybe find the parts to that story in a bin. Um, or you could just, uh, you know, sit, sit on the carpet. And, and I sometimes would have like a, a little felt board that had parts of the story. So that was one way that I started to think about how we really prepare the environment for a child to get to experience God's word in many different ways and in ways that are accessible to them. So um, if you go into some of the Sunday school rooms, like on Tuesday nights, we actually, Emmy does have it set up where you have a shelf and you have different puzzles and books, or maybe some, you know, little puppets that relate to that story. And then she sometimes has different godly play parts that are out for that story, or there's some blocks in the corner. There's a teepee that you could read some books uh, in or things like that. And so thinking about how you set up your environment for a child to get to experience the word of God rather than, and get to kind of follow where God is leading them to, rather than just going, okay, you come in and we all only do this one thing together and that's it. Um, you want children to really like, in, enjoy coming and being here and being present. And I have found in those moments where they're moving around the classroom and they're talking to, they're talking about the stories. You have these really beautiful moments where you can see that it's, it's being absorbed by them. It really is. Um, something I want to share with you is another book that uh, Maria Montessori wrote called The Absorbent Mind. This is a really amazing book. And one, um, I'll just kind of read maybe like a, a sentence or two that sort of helps you know what, what she's talking about when she talks about the absorbent mind. So she says, um, it is the child who absorbs material from the world around him. He who molds it into the man of the future. And so <clears throat> they actually, she really felt like everything around them, the words that were spoken, the environment, the way things were set up would be absorbed by their mind and will become the foundation of who they were. The first, the most important years of a child's life to her was zero to six, because those are the years where you absorb what the world is and it sets this foundation for the rest of your life. And she actually says this, um, this, this is one of my favorite parts she says is, um, it is the child who makes the man and no man exists who was not made by the child who once he was. So saying we all were children, we all were children. And so we became man by the work of 
us as a child. And I think that's something that I bring into um, my, my time at church and my own faith life is that, you know, how we talk with children now and interact with them now allows them to either really get to experience God's love or maybe not experience God's love. And um, I have found in my own life, just having like respecting a child, like they are their own being who has their own thoughts and ideas and motivations and coming to them and looking at them like that. I'm like, that's how God must look at us. <laughs> you know, God always looks at us as his child, you know? So there's been a lot of um, these wonderful moments that I have found in just reading about, kind of furthering into my job, reading about Maria Montessori and stuff that just makes me feel like I'm understanding something that God has done and had created here for us. Um, so I'd like to just end with maybe a few tips and then we could do questions and answers, which I would prefer. <laughs> um, but something I wanted to really send off with everyone listening though, was how this kind of concept of following the child and respecting the child um, can change our church. And I think we sometimes feel like having, uh, you know, conversations with children about, you know, some things it's like, they're too young, like how can they understand? Um, but they understand by watching us and how we deal with things. So, you know, something that my family does, I'll kind of speak to if you have children at home first. So we set up our environment in a way that God is present in our environment at home. So we always had our spark story Bible that we got at their baptisms out on the coffee table. And Kaz pretty much almost ripped the whole thing apart because he read it so much, you know, and we had the gratitude jar that we made at a family intergenerational event that Emmy hosted um, a few years, years ago. And we started the gratitude jar. It's just these colored popsicle sticks that you take out. And if you pick out red, it's about, um, it's, a, it's named some, a person you're thankful for. If you pick out green, it's name of food. And we did this before Casimir could even really talk. And he, we do it all the time. And it's such a great way for us to remind ourselves every day to be grateful for the things we have, but also allow our child to share with us the things that they're grateful for. And to see that we, you know, we're doing that same thing because they're absorbing everything that we're doing. Um, certain things like when we bring home artwork from Sunday school, you know, we put it up, I tape it up above our dining room table. Um, those Don't like things are baptismal. The ofrenda. The ofrenda. Oh, oh, our ofrenda. Yeah. So we also have like an ofrenda and it's this corner shelf and we have pictures of people um, who have passed in our life and we have a candle there. And so I have my father's picture and his ashes and I have, you know, some, some family that Luke uh, from Luke's family that we've never met, um, just to remember and honor them. And to talk about that idea when we just recently had my mom's dog pass and Casimir had lived with that dog for two years and it was really hard. He is four, but he felt that and he wanted to make sure that Blue was okay. And already having that ofrenda, you know, and already kind of having that place that we go to to remind us that God you know, that they're with God and to talk about heaven, you know, it's not, it's, it's something to me that I have found has made these tough moments in our lives easier to get through because God's already present in our home. So that was, that's kind of as a, uh, we also have their baptismal candles, um, out in their bedrooms. And so, you know, when it's their baptismal anniversary, we light their candle and we kind of go through the pictures of their baptism and talk about it. Uh, those, they're very little things, but they make a really big difference. Um, and some of the conversations that I've had with my four-year-old son 
about God, I'm like, you know, something that I don't know. Like (laughs) you are, you're just such a beautiful, you're so close to God. You know, they're so close to God when they're a child. And, um, so that's something that we do. If you have children at home, if you have grandchildren, that's something that's really nice to do. Uh, you can take that idea. If you don't have children in your own home and it's you who wants to be closer to God, I, you know, if you have a, a journal and you write letters to God, I knew a woman who wrote a letter to God every single day. And I bet she had that journal beside her bedside out and, and ready. Um, maybe having one of your favorite scriptures that calms you and makes you kind of feel better. Like mine is he restores my soul and he has made everything beautiful in its time. And I have a painting that says that in my house. So I can look at it when I feel like I need to pray to God. I need to like remember, um, what he teaches us. So these, those kinds of things that you can do in your own environment that just help you keep God close. And, um, and then, you know, it kind of spills over to who you are as an adult. And it's, it really, for me, it started to slow me down. It's, it started to remind me that I am not the all powerful one and I am not in control (laughs) and, and that God really is. And, um, and I've enjoyed kind of enjoyed letting go a little bit. And my job here at the school certainly helps me because I'm surrounded by children who just, they're present and they're here and they're living life and they are learning by just living life. And I realized that that's exactly what, how God, God designed it to be is <laughs> that we, by living our life, we learn what it is to be, um, to be kind of like a follower of Jesus. So does anybody have, I know uh, we may have a few more minutes for questions. If anyone has questions, it's really hard to, I would need like a whole year to sum up Montessori. So this was to do it in a few, and to do it in a few minutes is pretty tricky. So I know it's, um, yeah, but I'm here to answer any questions or anything you have. What is the age range for Montessori? Good question. So we actually, um, at the school I worked at, I moved campuses so you can do infant. There's an, we have an infant Montessori program. Uh, so usually like the youngest that comes in is six months. Um, that's not very common though. Uh, but that would go from birth to about like 18 months. So in Montessori, it's a three year period. Um, So that would be the first, that would be your infant room. That's why then it's 18 months to three years old for the toddler room. And then three years old to six year old for the primary. And all of these ages are together. We do not do like all three-year-olds, all four-year-olds, all five-year-olds. So in my classroom, I have an age range of 18 months to three. In my son's room, it's three to six. And then we have elementary, which is first to third grade. And then we have uh, the like fourth and fifth, kind of six together and then it goes into middle school um so we actually go all the way up to middle school you can go to a high school but it's not very common uh at least around here especially that's not very common um yeah that's a good question um i have a question Mm -hmm. and i hopefully i haven't forgotten it already I guess I never realized that Montessori had any Christian component because the first time I saw Montessori school and heard even a tiny bit about it would have been in the uh, DC area back in the the 70s. Mm -hmm. And um, I always viewed it as an unstructured school, but I didn't realize it was focused on really young children but um the the christian component if anything i would have assumed it was very non-christian in its orientation yeah i think that was what really was beautiful when i started to read if, if you want to know anything about montessori reading her books um is the first place to start and that's what I, you know, we don't teach Christian. We're not like a, we don't teach Christian 
you know, things in our school, but to say it was not influenced by that with, with Maria Montessori and where she came from. I mean, she, she was a Catholic and she had in all, all of her books, she brings up scripture and the Lord so much like, and it's interesting, like blessed are, she talks about how poor children would just love the toys and the things she would bring in. But actually when they started to spread the schools and it was like in richer communities, the children didn't have the same desire to be like, they didn't have the same like hunger to get those toys because they were rich. So they had a lot. And so she's like, blessed are the poor, right? It's like, so I was like, wow, there is such a foundation here of, you know, why we talk about one of the things is peace, um, peacemakers in our classroom. It's a huge part of our curriculum. You have a peace rose and you teach children how to deal with conflict, how to express themselves. And I'm like, Jesus was the ultimate peacemaker. And that's, you know, I'm kind of, I'm teaching them to do that too and to keep peace. And um, another part of it is cosmic education. When you get into elementary and middle school, cosmic education is actually what they use to sort of teach like history math. It's your relationship It's a, to the universe. So you actually learn about the world. So a child will start with the world map before they ever even get into North America, before they even get into the United States, before they even get into Pennsylvania. Like they learn about the world and this is where you are. Um, I think that's a beautiful thing too. I'm mean, like, that's what God shows us. We all are a part of the same world, although we live in different places in it. Um, it's ultimately, we are a part of this universe and they really, as you get into the higher education, that's a, that's how they teach it. Um, it's really beautiful. Hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. When you get into elementary and middle school ages, how do you incorporate or what's the difference between Montessori and also, of course, learning arithmetic and reading and so forth? What's the difference between a public school and Montessori at the older ages? So I can't speak too much to like how an elementary middle school classroom, like exactly what happens, um, but it's all of the arithmetic, the reading, writing is actually done uh, from the very beginning with our materials. So the materials, like if you're learning the, um, like the decimal system, you know, we actually in primary have kind of the starts of that by learning about things in groups of 10. Like if you remember maybe being a child and you would have like those 10 bars and then you would have like the hundred squares, kind of thinking of that, but we would have little beads. So it's like you learn one through 10 by it's a one bead and then it's two beads and it's three beads and you're in primary and you're counting these beads. And it ends up, so they, um, it's called the beaded stair and it's like this and you can, then what they do is then the beads are in, then they have a beaded cabinet. And so it's like the ones and then it's the twos and you actually learn, um, wow, I don't know math, but doubling up, what's the, when you square roots, <laughs> I'm sorry, like when you're, or when you're like, you know, nine times nine and eight times eight, that kind of thing the whole cabinet, they have chain beads that, that kind of help you through multiplication. And so you're in primary, you're learning this, but it's not explicitly like, here's a workbook. It's like, you kind of explore all these materials in the classroom. And when it comes time to really, you get to that point in your development that you're able to truly, you're able to understand those abstract concepts. So, um, and you have like first through third graders, right? So it's nice because you allow each child a lot of time to really absorb the material when they're ready to absorb it. Because a child that is in first grade and in, you know, and, and you say in a typical school, right? You have first grade and you've got to learn these things. And then once you're to second grade, you've got to like have known that. But not every child is able to do that. And so to have those three year age ranges, it allows them to really absorb the material and, and actually learn it and then get to the point where they're able to show it. Um, 
yeah, like reading is really early on, super early on. Like in toddler, it's uh, we do phonics, so it's actual sounds. It's twenty six letter sounds. Ah, b, k, d, f, g, h. You know, you don't actually learn like a, b, c, d. So by learning the sound of a letter and keeping it as simple, it's like it's how they start to um, start to sound letters out, and then writing comes before reading usually um in Montessori like a child naturally will actually write before they read so we do a lot of exercises you're writing with you're doing things with pencils you're there's a sand tray and you'll write a letter in a sand tray there's um sandpaper letters so it'll be uh a wooden square and then it'll they'll actually feel it we use all the senses here and so I ha I have sandpaper numbers in my toddler room they don't they're not going to know how to count one to ten but just already starting that idea of feeling what that one is and what's a two it's a year is years of kind of exposing them to these things um yeah so that's kind of how it works in a Montessori room and then as they get into elementary and middle school they they do a lot more like you'll never see like all of them just sitting down they're all working around they're doing a lot of project things um it's really wonderful to see and a lot of it's about leadership too so taking kind of ownership of you know being in that classroom and in that environment too is a big part of it so our middle schoolers cook they have a kitchen they have two conference tables with chairs all around and then they have like a lecture room and, um, you know, there are a lot of times just sort of like off in groups doing things. That's how it, that's kind of how it works. It's really following the child and what they're doing, um, but it's very structured. It's a lot of people think it's not at all. It's like a free reign. They must just come in and not nothing. It's structured because we control the environment. And that's, I put a lot of time into the classroom and by putting a lot of time into my environment, that's I that's my guide part of it. So I'm guiding them there, and then they kind of meet me there. Yeah. How large is your classroom? I, in the way of uh, students. Students. So because of to, like our you know when you have especially in toddlers, there's a Department of Health Services, so you have a one to five ratio. So I can have 15 children in this toddlers in this room at one time because I have we have three adults in here me and two other assistants so the room is the room's really big um but I have a total I have a I can have a total of like 20 students because they don't all come five days a week so I have some students that come two days and some three so I have about 21 students total and then 15 in the room um, which is really fun people are like I don't know how you want to do that but I'm like I I would lo I love working with 15 toddlers. <laughs> it's it's always like I said you're you're in the moment the whole entire time, you know. You really are. In elementary school, do you try do you try to keep everybody on the same page as you go or uh, I I'm trying to distinguish between people learn or students learning at their individual rates uh, versus the group learning say addition or something like that so that's the thing is the way it is is in our classroom it's you have every child kind of you would have like every child on a list and there's different parts of a classroom and i'll talk about primary because there's a little bit more but you have your language area you have your um, mathematics area, you have your practical life area, which is food prep, cleaning, clothes washing, baby washing, um, watering flowers, all those things, your practical life. And then you also have um, your cultural area, geography, cultural science area. Um, and then you have um, cultural, math, language, sensorial sensorial is kind of about learning size and depths and feeling smells so you'll have different like kind of bottles that you smell and guess what that smell is or you'll have different texture blocks you'll have color palettes and you'll maybe put a color um you'll sort colors and things like that 
So because a child, what you do is you actually track what each child, we track each child and where they are in the classroom. So like, for example, my son, he's getting to the age where now it's like, okay, he's ready to be doing phonics and really start writing. So his teacher is taking him and making sure to do lessons. We don't do a lot of group, like it's actually less group lessons. We in Montessori have something called the three hour work cycle. So if you have the ideal Montessori environment, a child will be working without any sort of like group thing happening for three hours because it takes that long for them to really get into the environment, start to work. But then we have something called line. So on this carpet, I have like an orange square and we would come and sit at line. And that's when I do maybe more of a lesson on like ways we're kind in our classroom or if you we have food tastings or if we, you know, um, need to kind of remember like, oh, let's do a lesson in pushing in our chairs um, or I can do a lesson on pouring. And so everybody can get that lesson. Uh, but normally in the classroom, it's individually one-on-one -on -one lessons all day long. And then you track through that time where each student has been. So if I notice one student's kind of falling behind, maybe not, I've not done enough mathematics work with them. I'm like, okay, this week I got to make sure that I get over to that student. And uh, we do some of those math works. So it's, yeah, it's not super efficient, <laughs> right? Because you're like not, but it actually works so well because if a child is advanced in mathematics, I can do an individual lesson and I'm not having to, I can really work with that child if they're advanced or if they need more help. So that's how it works in the Montessori class. Yeah, yeah. My, my question really stems from trying to think how a one teacher can uh, teach five different things or in five different levels to five different kids at the same time. Yeah, it sounds crazy, but it's totally possible. Um, and it is because of your environment. It's it's so much because of ev like they do have Montessori like kindergarten programs, actually, sometimes um, in, in different uh, areas. You know, that's a kind of common thing. Uh, but. Yeah, it, it, it feels so different than what we're used to doing and what we're you what our common experience is. if you've been to public school it's like but what do you mean like how does that work <laughs> um but it does and I have two assistants that also do it another thing that happens with a ch with children moving around right I will do a lesson I'll sit down with one student and do a lesson and there's two children standing there watching they're getting that lesson although I'm not working with them or if I'm cleaning, say everyone's sitting down at snack and there's a, there's a spill on the table, me just sweeping up that spill with our table crummer is a lesson. They're watching, you know? So um, that's where the adult part of it comes in from the you know child environment, adult part of Montessori is me as the adult, they're watching everything I'm doing. So if I'm, you know, stepping over tables or if I'm, you know, pushing in chairs with my legs, they think that's appropriate behavior. So it's so much about being intentional as a teacher because every single moment is a learning moment for them. And they're like, I do a lot of group yoga too. And that was only started because one student wanted to do it with me. And then all of a sudden nine are all around me doing it. And now there's like nine of us doing yoga. So that's like the fun part is sometimes works can be in a way that it's more than one child can benefit from it. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Any other questions? Okay, thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, if you have anything to wrap up or uh, that was very good. And now I understand a lot more. Yeah, I know it's it's a lot to pack into just a short <laughs> of time, um, but yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. And um, I'm definitely I've, I'm excited that our church kind of already had this sort of concept happening. And um, that's just something I know that we really I, I like to bring into my work. And I hope that we all if you can what you could take away from this is that maybe slow down and really like kind of 
watch some of the children in our church, you know, and just look at what they're doing and um, kind of take the time to have conversations with them and to really listen to them because, you know, there's such, God sent them here to teach us some stuff. <laughs> That's how I really feel. And I've enjoyed the children in our church are amazing. They are, uh, they have such spirit and such faith and, and such joy. So if you ever get a chance to just even drop in on something that they're doing or, you know, get to, you see, you saw you Sunday, right? And I think um, that's something I hope that we can do in our church is really start to realize that our children can teach us so much about God as much as we can teach them too. Yeah. Very well, good. thank you, Jack, for 